everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. This is going to be kind of a random unscripted video, but there was an article that was posted on Dragon Mount the other day, which is a big Wheel of Time community website uh, by Jason Denzel, one of the founders of Dragon Mount, um, that I think is pretty interesting and I want to go through with you all and give you guys my reaction. Basically, this is some news from the upcoming television show. Not necessarily news, but, but more his reaction to some things that he knows uh, that aren't necessarily related to the production, but his uh, ideas of what might be happening. I want to give you my reactions to some of the things that he says. He is a very well-respected uh, person in this community, and so when he says something, I, I definitely want to pay attention to that. And so what we'll do is dive into it here. So let, let's take a look at the article. So let's go ahead and throw up a spoiler warning for the video, even though it's kind of a rambly me talking video. This video will carry a spoiler rating of red, meaning it will have major spoilers all the way through A Memory of Light, watch at your own risk. So what I've got up here on the screen is that article. I will have that linked down below in the description if you guys want to read this on your own. But uh, let's go ahead and dive into this. After four years of relative quiet, excitement for the Wheel of Time is surging again thanks to the upcoming or the forthcoming TV show scheduled for a 2020 or 21 release on Amazon Prime. Real quick, we'll stop right there. That's something that I think is probably in the works, guys. If they're starting filming here in September, I would say that it's fairly, uh, I would expect a 2020 release. It's possible that it might be pushed back to 2021 if they need to reshoot or anything like that, but I would expect a 2020 release. We know very little about the creative direction that the show will take, but we know it left a positive impression on Brandon Sanderson, who recently shared his admiration for both the first two episode scripts and for Rafe Judkins, the executive producer, writer, and showrunner. Because that was, uh, that was, and I, I'm, I guess we'll be stopping a lot through the article here, but that was something that was pretty encouraging to me. If Brandon is impressed with Rafe, uh, I have a lot of respect for Brandon Sanderson, not only as an author himself, but as the person who knows quite a bit about The Wheel of Time. So that left me uh, with, with the little information that we have, that leaves me with a positive feeling. And of course, there was a bit of excitement last week when Rafe in the studio announced that Rosamund Pike would be playing Moraine. If you guys saw my video that we released about the uh, breaking news before this was actually released, that actually came true. So uh, if this is new to you, Rosamund Pike was cast as Maureen. So what else can we expect from the forthcoming TV show? Here are my best guesses. For some disclaimers, I have no involvement with the forthcoming TV show, although I've been in touch with some of the folks at Amazon. Before that, from around 2005 to 2011, I was a consultant to Red Eagle Entertainment, the group that originally acquired the rights to the series and remains an executive producer on the show, though the scope of their creative involvement is unknown. Back then, I was heavily involved in the creation of outlines and story treatments for a potential theatrical film release. That project fizzled, but it helped familiarize me with the scale that executives were going for at that time and how the thinking has evolved over the years. While none of that makes me an expert in the TV effort, the ideas below come from a reasonably well-informed position. Without further ado, here are the top five things I think we can expect to see in the Wheel of Time TV show. So let's stop there and unpack some of that. Uh, as I was saying before, Jason Denzel, the guy who wrote this article, he is the founder of Dragon Mount, which is the pretty much the big Wheel of Time website. He has been involved with the community. I think he's on the board for JordanCon. Um, he's super well-known, guys. He's been a, a huge fan of the series. He's been a big part of that community. He's actually an author himself, and I think he does some video work. I'll, I'll link in the description. He made a trailer video for Towers of Midnight before it came out. That was awesome. I watched that and it gives me chills. I'll have that linked in the description below if you want to see it. But he was a consultant before when they were trying to adapt the series. Not that that has anything to do with this, but I'm sure he's been involved in discussions with Amazon. So some of the things that he's saying here, while they're not official in any capacity, I think there's a pretty good... I take when he says something, I, I, I'll just put it this way. When he says it, I have a feeling that a lot of this is probably more true than not. Okay. So let's unpack some of this. Uh, adult content. We all know that Amazon's Wheel of Time show, along with millions of other TV shows, are going for the er, throne that Game of Thrones until recently occupied. Game of Thrones succeeded for many reasons. One of those reasons is that it didn't pull any punches. The Wheel of Time books are full of battles and romance but in a strictly PG-13 manner. I expect to see Wheel of Time I expect to see the Wheel of Time TV show dive into the sex and battles more. Especially one power battles. 
it'll help sell the show to a wider, more general audience that's hungry for adult fantasy. This idea is further confirmed by a casting call notice from last April that the show is t- seeking two female actresses p- to play characters named Eliza and Nady or Natty, probably code names for Egwene and Nynaeve, that would require scenes of sexual nature and partial nudity. It could just be a rumor, but the original source has a j- decent track record of accurate information, including correctly revealing Rosamund's role in the production before the official announcement. All of this is to say... Don't be surprised if we see Two Rivers characters and others getting busy on screen. So this echoes what I've been talking about before. Uh, I, it does bring up another topic that I'll, I'll dive into here in a second. Um, but basically what he's saying here, expect to see some sex and expect to see some violence. Uh, they are trying to attract not just book readers, guys. They, they want book readers to want this, but that's not the primary audience. The idea is to bring in folks that have never read the books or haven't even heard of them and make them want to watch this. That's what happened with Game of Thrones. That's why it got huge. That's what they're aiming for. You may not like that, but there will be some sex. Now, are they going to take it overboard? Is this going to just be uh, Wheel of Boobies? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it will be. I, I don't think that's the direction they're going. Uh, Rafe did say it would be accessible, but I do think you're going to see it, guys. I, I, I don't see any way around that. Now, I want to address something he said, which I find weird in this community. So he said, the Wheel of Time books are full of battles and romance, but in a strictly PG-13 manner. And if you've heard me talk about this before, I don't necessarily think that's true. I think the way, I think Robert Jordan was inconsistent with this. I think there are certain things, namely language and explicit sexual descriptions that he was PG-13 about. There aren't any traditional swear words. We don't hear so-and-so did this to so-and-so sexual. I mean, we don't hear those things. It's implied. However, the violence is very clearly de- implied, and not only implied, but stated. It's probably the most violent fantasy book I've ever read. People literally explode. So it's weird in that he describes these things kind of vaguely, but then also some things are very strict, and I think because a lot of us attach... Um, we don't think of violence as being as bad as nudity, at least in American culture for whatever reason. So when people say, well, it wasn't overly sexual, so it must be G- G-rated. I've even he- pe- heard people say that this is a G-rated series, which I find crazy. Uh, I think there's just an inconsistency, and I think that lends itself to people thinking it's PG-13, when in reality, just for the violence, this is going to be rated R if they keep it strict. So either way, I don't think it matters. I think we're going to see it ramped up a little bit. I don't think we'll see explicit sex all over the place, but we are going to see it. Okay, moving on here. Eight to ten episodes focused on the eye of the world. Amazon and Rafe have announced that the official number of episodes, or I'm sorry, Amazon and Rafe haven't announced the official number of episodes, but we know they will be an hour long. Eight to ten episodes is consistent with other Amazon originals in recent years. I can confirm that. I did a bunch of research on it. Wheel of Time could receive more than 10, but I think it's a stretch to say that that'll happen in the first season, especially since the episode budgets could quickly balloon with visual effects. Very true. I, I don't see it getting more than 10. I'd like to see more, but I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Coffee. As for whether or not we'll see more than the Eye of the World portrayed on the screen in Season 1... Rafe has already said the show will pull from everywhere as needed, but I believe the main season arc will focus on the flights from the two rivers, leading ultimately to the Blight, where the season finale will focus on the Eye itself. A fan asked Rafe this question on Twitter, and he gave a short, cryptic response. Hello, Rafe. Do you anticipate Season 1 taking up the Eye of the World, and Season 2 being the Great Hunt? Rafe, yes and no. The main argument for Season 1 focusing on Book 1 comes down to the fact that if you pull too much from Book 2 and beyond, it's just too much to develop and a general audience to buy into. In 8-10 to episodes, they need to already introduce a complicated world and backstory, 7 main protagonists, 3-5 to major antagonists, Fane, Balazamon, I always screw that up, White Cloaks, Trollocs, Aes Sedai, and so on. Once you add in the Horn of Valir and the Shanchan, it simply becomes too much too soon. The whole hunt for the horn makes great season two material, and possibly getting into book three, depending on how many episodes get greenlit. Yes, there are way there are lots of ways to skin a cat, but it feels right to do season one equals book one, just like Game of Thrones did to great success. Now, 
I've got two opinions on this. Number one, ideally what he is describing here is exactly what I want. I want season one to be book one. I think it, it it's a very self-contained season. I think it can hook people. I think it expands the world building if we get to spend time. However, based on what we already know, I find it hard to believe that's going to happen. We have episode titles. Now, so this has been brought up in my Discord server, and so I do want to address it. Based on what we've seen, it looks like we're going to see book one and book two put into season one, just based on the episode titles. I've talked about this in previous videos. However, um, I, he could be massively misleading us. And so there could be some small changes, like uh, he brings up, uh, and we'll talk about this in a second, but there's characters that could be merged. There's whole sections of that book that be, could be combined, um, that it might lead us to a different place. And so we might be being misled with the titles where it's maybe not, and maybe that is all book one. And so we don't really know that yet. So I, I think this could be true, what he's saying. I also think he's completely ignoring the fact that Rafe has released episode titles. So, and those happen to be chapter titles from the book that happen in different areas. So we know how fast, if he's using those chapter titles to represent the exact actions, then we, we know where those are going. So we will see. Um, I, he could be just misleading us. And I, I think that would be a great troll if he did, because this is actually what I want to see. What he's got here written out is what I want to see. All right, expanding secondary characters and maybe a few big omissions. Since the project was greenlit last October, there has been nonstop talk that Moraine would be the focus of the series, or at least of season one. We don't know how that will play out, of course, but it's likely that all the attention on her in the press releases has been due to the fact that Rafe and company have planned it to cast a big-name actress for the role from the very start. She and Lan are the most logical choices for bringing brand-name actors on board in order to reach a wider audience. I expect we'll get into their backstory sooner than the books do, and also deeper into the Aes Sedai Warder connection. I don't think we'll be seeing full or lengthy full episode New Spring flashbacks per se, but pulling for Moraine's younger years wouldn't surprise me either. Rafe has also stated that he plans to expand. Rafe has oh, let's let's try that one again. Rafe has stated that he plans to expand Loghain's character, which is a great idea. Seeing more of Loghain allows us to see male channelers before Rand really gets going. If you buy into the earlier idea that season one will focus on the Eye of the World, then that means that they will have eight to ten hours to explore the first book, which is plenty of time to expand on a brooding false dragon. I have a hunch that he might steal the show early on with his charisma and power. Other expanded roles that we're likely to see, the Children of the Light, Jeff from Bornhold would make a great bad guy, Elias, Hopper, and the other wolves, the Tinkers with Arm, and Pat and Fane. The jury's still out on what the production plans to do with Min, Tom, Elaine, Galad, Gawain, and Loyal. All of these except Tom and Loyal have cameo roles in the first book, so I expect that they will either get expanded Expanded roles in the season one, or possibly, sorry, get cut from the season. I know, I know, it's hard to imagine a Wheel of Time TV show without Elaine or Min, but everything's fair game, people. Maybe if Moraine leads everyone to Tarvalin instead of Camelin, then the writers can easily introduce Elaine and her brothers being there for training. Loghain can also be gentled there, which would give us introductions into Elida and the Amarlin Sea, all at one nice location that's visually amazing to look at. Or maybe those secondary characters, Min, Elaine, etc., are introduced in the second season. Okay, there is a lot to unpack from that. So, first of all, I want to say this. Guys, he is not saying that these things are happening. So before you freak out in the comments and say, I cannot believe that they, he, they're they going to do this, no. He is throwing out random ideas of things that might happen. Okay, so one of the things when they do these shows, they are going to combine, they are going to have to think, okay, do we want to bring in a big name that maybe could have been mentioned early, but have them come in. Uh, for instance, when they brought in Oberyn Martell in season four of Game of Thrones, that was a big addition. We 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 paid attention to the hire. We knew who they were bringing in to do it. So that was coming in. We knew what was coming. Uh, and he could have maybe been dropped earlier, like name dropped or been in the show earlier, but they put him in there. They might do that in, in this. They might bring in and introduce a new character in a new season. Okay, so that what he's saying is they may not make it in season one. Now, a couple of the characters he mentioned, 
I'm fairly certain we're actually going to see Loyal because Rafe posted out a glory to the builders tweet uh, a while, while back, which is again an O-gear. So I, I think we're going to see Loyal. I don't see how they cut Tom out. Now, everybody else could be cut. I, I, they could avoid Camelin altogether. I think that is something that could happen. Again, they've got a limited budget, and so maybe they want to show Tarvalin instead of Camelin. Who knows? Um, again, none of that's for certain, but baby, basically what he's saying is we are going to see Moraine expanded. I don't think she's going to be the main focus for the whole season, but she's going to start off that way, or at least they're going to promote it that way because Rosamund is the big name. That's how they're going to bring in new people. Okay, less binary evil. The Eye of the World was written... The Eye of the World was written in the late 1980s and published in early 1990. Robert Jordan intentionally designed the opening to resemble Lord of the Rings with its dark riders and quiet, idealistic, rural countryside. And then flipped everyone's expectations after Shadar Logoth. At the time, this approach was groundbreaking, and where he takes the sequels is still, to this day, original and remarkable. But many of the ideas in the first book have been copied and done many times since by a lot of writers. And the result is the binary good farm boys versus pure evil dark one isn't going to cut it with a general audience anymore. Rafe touched on this subject during his Twitter Q&A. I think most people would say the central key core conflict of the series is light versus dark, but I'd actually say that it's balance versus imbalance. The easy solution to this is to introduce more nuanced antagonists as early as possible. The White Cloaks, Elida, and even Pat and Fane, who could hold on to a shred of humanity perhaps, offer opportunities to craft bad guys that have somewhat relatable or at least understandable motivations beyond simply wanting the world destroyed. I doubt we'll see many of the Forsaken besides Baalzaman in the first season, unless by flashback, but if we do, I wouldn't be surprised if they become less pure evil as well. Robert Jordan's Forsaken, while interesting and fun, were admittedly somewhat flat until Asmodian arrived on the scene. Lanfear Selene is a possible exception, but I would be stunned if she had a role in season one. She could be a big-name actress they could bring in for Season 2. Okay, I 100% I agree with everything he just said. Uh, people were freaking out in my last video about the maybe not having it be light versus dark, but balance versus imbalance. Guys, that's already a theme. He didn't make that up. That's already in the books. They talk about that. And so the whole theme of the Wheel of Time, I mean, look at the logo, is balance. When things are imbalanced, when Rand talks about eliminating the Dark One, that's equally as bad as if the Dark One wins. The Dark One wants imbalance, and the creator or the world is designed to function with balance, so good and evil. So that is the core conflict. So I don't think he's off base in saying that. Um, and so I do love that the idea, if we just have mustache-twirling villains that are just evil for the sake of being evil, those have no depth and they're not fun to watch. That's not going to fly in today's climate with the stories that we like to watch. We want to know why characters do what they do. Cersei was a great villain in Game of Thrones because we understood her motivations. We understood where she was coming from. So, yeah, she she turned crazy, but she lost all her kids, She all that. So, long and short of it, I, I love what he just said there. All right, I'll, 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 anytime I read this, <laughs> I, I already know this one's going to cause a whole lot of uh, conflict in the comments. More diversity. Finally, expect the Wheel of Time TV show to double down on its diversity of characters and relationships. Rand has been very public about this. Rafe has been very public about this, stating outright that this is an important theme to him. I think that gender is a key theme in the books, and discussing gender with a full representation of LB LGBTQ plus people would be a disservice to that discussion. Rest assured, there will be pillow friends out the wazoo. I'm a feminist, and it's fairly important to me that the show is feminist in today's concept, on context. Okay, before you absolutely flip out in the comments, hear the rest of this out. The most obvious place we're going to likely see changes is in the romantic relationships. While I don't, see, while I don't think that we'll see Rand and Perrin kissing each other, imagine those shipping debates. Can I coin the term Raren or Perrin? <laughs> uh, it wouldn't shock me if Egwene, Moraine, Elias, Aram, Galad or Loghain became involved in same-sex relationships. Besides, did any of you really totally buy the Moraine-Tom romance from the books? I kind of did. But some of these might not blossom in season one, but certainly could later. 
We're also likely to see a wider racial diversity in the cast. I know Robert Jordan is very specific with his descriptions of every character and culture, but when it comes to adaptations like this, nothing is guaranteed. Rafe and his team already cast a tall Moraine, so who knows, right? Take a look at this script excerpt Rafe shared on Twitter last August, which points to the very first page. A quick note, Race in the Wheel of Time is much less defined in our world. As much as possible, our cast should look like America will in a few hundred years. A beautiful mix of white, brown, black, and everything in between. The Eye of the World portrays all seven of the main characters, the, f the five Two Rivers people, Moraine and Lan, as light-skinned. Add in Elaine, her brothers, and men, we have a whole lot of similar-looking characters. This is, in fact, a trend throughout the books. Sure, there's differences between the Kyrianan and Andorans, but it isn't really until later in the books where we see the Shanchan, especially Tuon, the Sea Folk, Fael, and some Western nations with more racial diversity. An exception to this is the Shinarans, who appear at the end of the first book. Here's what Rafe had to say about this when questioned by a fan on Twitter. I really want to stay true to the books by creating a world that feels way more diverse than what we're used to seeing in other fantasy TV shows. I know that we could all debate what certain characters look like for days and weeks. That also sort of supports my point that there are plenty of room for in, there is plenty of room for interpretation, especially as we, as we especially as we move away from the two rivers. My hunch is that the Emmons fielders will look a lot like what we expect, but beyond that, there will be much more racial diversity. Loghain, Elias, Swan Sanche and the Shinarans are all easy candidates for looking different than Robert Jordan perhaps portrayed them. I agree with that to an extent, okay? So let me back up and look at some of this stuff. So in terms of the uh, LB LGBTQ people and, and having in same-sex romances or changing up some of the romances, we don't know what that's going to be. I'm not going to react to that until I see it, whether or not I'm going to be upset by it. The, the concept of b there being that in the show does not upset me. If that upsets you, um, look, you, I, I said this in my Q in my uh, live, live stream. You can be upset that you don't want the core of the book to be changed, and that's fine. Um, I, I can understand that if the story changes and that you don't want to see your favorite story changed in that way. I, I get that. But if you're, hey, I don't want this to change because I don't, I can't stand to see gay people on TV then you need to question where or not that that feeling is coming from. So those there's two distinctions there. Um, so uh, look, I'm not I'm going to reserve my judgment on whether or not I'm happy with those changes until I actually see what they will be. Until that point, I, I'm open to the concept. Again, I just want to see it adapted well. Now, the other parts of this about the racial diversity, uh, guys, that's going to happen, and I'm not the slightest bit upset by it. That doesn't make me a social justice warrior. It doesn't at all. What it does make me is somebody who doesn't care about that. Um, I don't think their skin color makes much of a difference. I think aside from, and I like what he said here, having the, the people from Emmons Field, who is an isolated community, having them look the same makes sense to me, whatever that is. But once they leave there, it's totally open game to me. This was a world that was combined during the Age of Legends and has been that way for a long time. So I don't have an issue with that. Again, I, I would question if you said, well, I can't believe they made Swan Sanche an Indian actress. If that really inflames you and upsets you, I think you need to question where that's coming from, not just, you know, flipping out. Because, again, that's not a change that has any real bearing. Her, her looks don't matter. Just as the same as Moraine being short. Yeah, that's big, but it's not a plot point. So it's not a huge deal that Moraine's going to be tall. In the same way, I, I don't care about their skin color. That's just my opinion. I know some of you will have a different opinion on that. So last part here, the books are great. Why change all this? Everyone knows that TV and movie adaptations bring change, and passionate fans like you and I are likely to scratch our heads and wonder why they'd change something when it all works so well on page. As discussed above, the first book in this series was written nearly 30 years before its TV adaptation release, and the audience expectations have changed since then. We also have the hindsight now to understand what works in the books and what could stand to be better. Do you really think they'll have parents spend three seasons trying to rescue Fael? I'm looking at this TV show as a fresh turn of the wheel. And the, the third age that I read in the books has passed, and to be reborn now, and the wheel is turned all the way around. With every coming of an age, there's the same story again, yet different. While this may not be the official explanation from the show's producers, I think that's a good way to look at it. We'll always have the books to return to. Those aren't going anywhere. By allowing ourselves to accept changes from book to screen, 
even the ones we don't fully like, we open ourselves to having a better experience. I, for one, am beyond excited to see what Rafe and his team do. So what do you think? Okay, so let's stop there. Uh, last thing he's saying here, open to it. Guys, I, this is where I'm at with it. Do I want to see the show being a faithful adaptation of the books? Absolutely. Do I know there's going to be changes? Yes. Here, I can I can love the books for what they are, and I love them. It's my favorite series by far. I have a YouTube channel about it. I'm a nerd. But the I can respect the show for being something different as well. Now, if it is a bad story, the way they adapt it, I'll be upset. But I know there will be changes, and if they do well with it, and it's exciting and intriguing to watch, and it's a little different, I'm not going to be upset by that. I can respect both things for what they are. Okay, so that's where I'm at with it. I am interested to know what you all think. Um, I know a lot of you are going to say, oh, it's just the social justice warrior changes. And look, I, I, I'm as concerned as some of you are about the way that they might change things. But I guess the way I'm looking at it is I'm excited to see how it might be adapted. And a lot of the things aren't that big of a deal to me. So I am interested to see what you all think. Hey, sorry for the really unscripted and uh, uh, meandering video. I just wanted to give you guys kind of my reactions to this and let you know all what I thought. So, hey guys, uh, please like the video and subscribe uh, to the channel if you like the content. Uh, check out my Patreon if you want to support what I do here on the channel. And guys, until next time, thank you all for watching. Peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? Tinker asked the mistress, don't you got a labour man? Yes, but she replied, he lacks your talent and your hands And I can tell you got the skill to hit the spots you see So Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? Tinker said the neighbour boy could probably get it done He's far too inexperienced, I'll never go that young I'm sure he can be broken in or top, but he's too sweet So Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? The mistress asks the tinker, can you help me move the chairs? They're just a bit too heavy and they need to go upstairs. She bats her eyes, the tinker sighs, then picks them up with ease. So tinker, manly tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? The mistress told the tinker, there's a problem with me bed. It's rough and full of lumps, the thought of sleep fills me with dread. I'm sure if we just roll around, I'd cry aloud in glee. So, Tinker, handsome Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? Tinker in his small clothes while he's underneath the sheets. When the sound of footsteps in the kitchen start to creak, he's unaware, don't use the stair or you'll get caught and beat. So, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? Come on now go use the window, no need for him to see So Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me Hey!